Hello and welcome to Tomorrow Orbit 12.24. Glad to have you here today and uh, we could, I guess, go through a quick round of introductions. Uh, you probably know who I am. I'm Jared. I'm one of the hosts of Tomorrow. And this guy right next to me, you probably know who he is as well. It's uh, Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. So, and uh, hey. holy smokes, here you are again on this show. Uh, I can't, I can't stay away. You know, uh, tomorrow you guys are like my all time favorite space show. I've been watching tomorrow for probably three or four, probably four years now. And l l please let me like, let me, let me say this right now. If okay, you go for are, it. Uh, if, if you came here from like my Twitter or from, I posted on my like YouTube community thing and you don't know what the show is, you have been missing out for a long time, for 12 years now, you've been missing out because this is the definitive best space show on the internet. So please subscribe to them. I think they're about to crack 50,000. Let's get them those 50,000 subscribers that they so deserve. So that's my quick shout out. All right. Tomorrow. Well, thank you, Tim. Checks in the <laughs> mail. So uh, today's with Orbit 12.24. Uh, we're going to be talking about something that has become uh, very popular uh, recently. Um, you know, over the past couple of years, we've been talking about stuff that's been leading up to what happened this year which is uh, essentially a, a overview and maybe a talk and maybe a slight debate um, about SpaceX's Starship uh, and their Star Hopper and everything associated uh, with that today. So Tim, you are basically one of the, I guess I would, I would describe you as one of the leading experts um, in this system as to what SpaceX is doing. Do you wanna give us a little quick rundown about sort of like what has led up to this moment with SpaceX's work? Yeah, yeah. so that's, the, oh, that's a, <laughs> first off, I'm not an expert. I'm just professionally curious about all things uh, <laughs> bonkers and stainless steel, I think. Uh, <laughs> but okay, so, so really what, what's led up to this point is SpaceX's uh, obsessive pursuit of reusability. And this has been, you know, a mix. And in order for, I guess, how about I say this? Obsessive pursuit of trying to get to Mars. And in order to do that, obsessive pursuit of reusability. Because really, that's the main factor in bringing the cost and the availability of space flight down. You know, if, if, if we're actually to get things in space and get big payloads off to Mars, you can't be throwing rockets away. It's fundamental. And that's been something that Elon Musk has been saying since day one of SpaceX. And uh, this is like the... The uh, I think this is about to be the mic drop moment for the space industry where it's finally like, look, we, we are going all in on reusability. We are going all in on a vehicle with an, a crazy payload capability. And that's really what Starship is. It's, it's the pursuit of trying to have airliner like reuse in space delivery. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, delivering gigantic payloads into Earth orbit, uh, tremendous amounts. Uh, to translunar injection, trans Mars injection, and maybe other places as well throughout the solar system. Because it's, I mean, Mars has been the focus, but with, with Starship and its associated super heavy launch vehicle, uh, there has been talk about sending cargo slash human missions even further out, uh, which would be absolutely amazing. So Stanley Kubrick would probably mm -hmm. be doing backflips, uh, hearing that <laughs> happening, uh, with that. Now, um, a little bit of, uh, sort of like technical background with it. Um, they sort of started with the Mars Colonial Transporter, uh, MCT, mm -hmm. which was yep. essentially internal. Um, that really wasn't ever like publicly, openly publicly discussed. It wasn't until uh, the, um, it was at IAC 2016, um, when they, yes. they in unveiled the interplanetary transport system, which was this monster yep. of a rocket and spacecraft that would be able to transport a hundred people to Mars at a time. Um, yep. and I, I mean, a lot of cargo too, um, in order to do that. <laughs> and then they scaled that back because they thought that was a little too unrealistic, um, and kind of scaled it back to something that they thought could actually happen. And that's where we got the BFR BFS combination from. <laughs> And now we're at the combination of Super Heavy with Starship. So we've gone through multiple iterations of a design. And that is, uh, in some of them, and there's been radical changes with it as well. Um, we originally started with a spacecraft that kind of really did look like sort of like Buck Rogers status. 
Um, so if you're mm -hmm. a big if you're a big fan of like 50s and 60s aesthetic, you were probably super excited to see that. Um, and then we st saw the sort of uh, this the very small space shuttle style double delta uh, wings on it, although yeah. lots of people said they weren't wings, but guess what, they're wings um, on there. And then uh, eventually we get to the point now where it looks like uh, the uh, Planet Express from uh, uh, Futurama, where we've got basically yeah. two good size wings and a big vertical stabilizer on it. Um, yeah. And uh, with all of these changes, uh, is that something that's going to like be helpful with it, that we've had all these rapid changes very quickly with it? or? Do you feel like with a project of this magnitude, that's maybe not the best way to go about it? So I'm starting to see this entire vehicle and this entire, everything about Starship, I'm starting to see almost in a different light, especially watching even something as basic. I'm going to use very much quotes uh, with the word <laughs> basic for Starhopper. But you're watching things change literally on the fly and to the point where they don't even have like a flame trench or sound suppression system yet down in Boca Chica when they're doing the Starhopper hops. Um, they're literally just going like step by step by step by step, like solve one problem before you start introducing new, new solutions, you know, trying to solve it on paper before you actually know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? So things like how many fins, even the number of engines changes about every five days right now. And that's because it can, like they're at that point where they're just trying to solve uh, step one and step two and step three, step four out of 48,000 steps, you know, <laughs> and it's different. We're not used to seeing this from the outside. If you're in a company, I'm sure this stuff happens constantly. That's called engineering, mm -hmm. but from public perception, like it's, it's strange to see a vehicle, a vehicle change so much, but really at this point, it's not been much more than, um, you know, an advanced concept, but it's all really pivoting on, on two things using a methane fueled engine and that engine is full flow stage combustion cycle those are that's like the main thing that they had to figure out and and nail down because once that is solidified you can design your vehicle around that and so things like the fins um and wings and all those things i think those are still subject to change there's a good chance i remember when elon i, I just watched dear moon again when he when he kind of showed off the the current version of what we know starship as and you know he mentioned that the vertical stabilizer isn't even necessary knowing spacex that probably means that ver vertical stabilizer in the near future is going to be gone you know it's like they're not gonna I, I know for symmetry's sake it looks cool but maybe they'll go with something different maybe these wings will grow maybe they'll shrink maybe the canards up front will change you know everything that we know about starship is still very much subject to change and um it's just it's just a different way of doing things it's not trying to be solved on paper first and uh, you know, slide rule and paper, so to speak, um, or engineering. It's like, let's work on step one, step two steps in order. And then as those things get solved, let's go to the next step. So yeah. And it's just different. As you said, radically different um, from the way other aerospace companies have worked. I think back to the space shuttle, um, which is officially signed in the contract in 1972, didn't fly its first flight till 1981. Um, but there were not, if you look at the original design of shuttle from 72 and then the final vehicle that flew in 81, um, there really wasn't much in terms of radical change for design, uh, propulsion, systems on board, APUs and everything around it. Um, it's not like how Starship, like we are mentioning, seems like every five days they update how many engines are gonna be going on this dang thing. Uh, so. So, uh, yeah, I think I think a lot of people's uncomfortability really does come from uh, the fact that it's just so like out there um, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, working with it. Um, and actually, Mr. Gonzanator on YouTube has a pretty interesting uh, point uh, to make with that there, which is, is that uh, Blue Origin seems to have taken the polar opposite approach, uh, sort of locking themselves into a a uh, system and then working with that as effectively as they can. So, so I'll have to uh, counter that though. I, I think it's part of the difference is I don't think Blue Origin's locking themselves into a system. I just don't think they're showing us <laughs> what they're doing. You know, I, <laughs> I think they're doing a similar thing behind the scenes as what SpaceX is doing, which is kind of solving one thing and developing a vehicle around it. We've already seen a few changes to New Glenn and then in the size of the, the fins and things like that. And, and the thrust structure and the legs, you know, things like that are changing. We just don't see it nearly. We don't, they don't have a CEO that's sitting there on Twitter 
virtually every day giving behind the scenes real time updates of the development of the vehicle. You know, so I think behind the scenes they're doing something similar. It's just a lot more controlled communication style that is more traditional and more akin to like, you know, what we'd seen in the past. But um yeah, I mean, New Glenn has actually changed a lot in the past three years as well, but it's just we're not seeing all of those changes. For, yeah, you know, real time. of course, that's because, you know, Blue Origin in a couple of weeks is just going to stream from their moon base that they have put up there. Uh, they just happen to let us all know that they've got one uh, at the second <laughs> as well. So, uh, <laughs> Honestly, it wouldn't surprise me. It really, I'd be like, yeah, OK, that eh, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> they've been launching from Antarctica or something this whole time. And <laughs> We've been none the wiser. <laughs> um, yeah, and of course, there's some people that are that are sort of uh, letting me know about shuttle as well. You know, M. Miss Nice Liff on YouTube is saying if you look at the very early shuttle designs, uh, they look virtually nothing like the one that flew. Even Dutta is saying uh, there were dramatic changes uh, to shuttle design as well throughout that. Um, and and there there were in terms of of exterior. Um, and, and some of the interior designs too, but de definitely nothing on the level that we're seeing with, with, uh, with Super Heavy and Starship, uh, just like pinging off every day, um, with it there, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think once, you know, once the actual proposal was accepted, it was pretty well locked in place, you know, as far as, uh, but pre, you know, at very first when the space shuttle had like, you know, we we're talking, there's like, oh, we're going to have two, you know, jet on one stage with rockets on mm -hmm. it. And then the orbiter on top of that, you know, I mean, there were literally like dozens of cool yeah. radical proposals. Oh, we're going to put the one, two, orbiter on a Saturn, you know, and launch it that way. And I was yeah. Thinking, yeah, yeah, just really, really interesting ideas. Saturn, that was really cool. And there were, I mean, there were proposals like that, but once they locked down to the space shuttle concept, and especially once they manufactured the first one from the first uh, one through the the fifth orbital versions, very few things changed. Yes, people will argue that, like, no, things changed quite a bit. It's like, not by, like, SpaceX standards. You know, look at how much the Falcon 9 has changed since its debut compared to today. Um, I, we're going to see that same type of thing with Starship. Like, right now we're seeing... Starship and the first Starship will look nothing like the eighth Starship, I'm thinking. And then the eighth Starship will look nothing like the 40th Starship, you know? So we're going to have Starship and, and then Starship 1.1 and Starship you know, 1.2, full throat, block five Starship. It's just, it's just going to be completely different vehicles every single time. Yes, I agree. And it's likely that for now they're sticking with nine meters in diameter, which is, you know, about 30 feet wide um, and, and just kind of a design that's, I'll say reasonable, <laughs> even yeah. though it's still like massive compared to most other rockets ever. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they're starting there, and th that'll be a good test bed. And I, I have no doubt that they're going to grow up to that twelve meters, and then from there they could scale up to fifteen meters wide. Just keep going with the thing, you know. Once you have the solutions, you know, the heat shielding solutions, the engines, the material, the fuselage. Once you have all that stuff nailed down. Uh, why not grow it? You know, and I think that's kind of their attitude. So I don't think we'll see a nine meter wide starship last very long. Cause I think once they get that, they'll be like, okay, let's just keep going. Yeah. And actually one of our, uh, one of the folks in the YouTube chat room, uh, freebie 0101, uh, says that now they're just welding, uh, stainless steel in the open. Uh, why not wider diameter than nine meters again? And I, I think, you know, just, uh, I think nine meters is just a good place to start. Like they said, they didn't yeah. they didn't feel like the 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 uh, financial viability was there to develop a, t a twelve meter vehicle yet, so they went back to nine meters in order to start with that. And I kind of agree and, with you. And just, yeah, look at look at the finances. Yeah, if you're if you want to like uh, mitigate risk, you know, if if something doesn't work out in this architecture and they started with a 12 meter wide vehicle, that's going to require 50 percent more engines or whatever, which is, again, you know, 50 percent more cost. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's going to require X, Y and Z and just bigger everything. So a bigger launch structure, a bigger, you know, everything to support a 12 meter ship is uh, is more expensive. And so to mitigate risk and to solve solve the problems of full reusability, they're still starting off extremely ambitious. I mean, mm -hmm. who's I'm shocked they didn't do something Falcon 9 sized, you know, using existing Falcon 9 architecture, basically solve it at that scale and then scale it up to say nine meters, 12 meters, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so nine meters is already a really crazy place to start. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, and actually, Roger C. in our YouTube chat room is asking, why didn't they double the size of Falcon Heavy? So, because, I mean, it seems like a natural progression to to maybe just, you know, put put more boosters on it. Make it a, just take the Falcon <laughs> 9 and make it even bigger. Um, you know, uh, with and there's some good reasoning behind those changes with it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think... So many people, you know, when, when you talk about reuse, people are always saying, like, why, you know, why don't they just reuse Falcon 9 or make Falcon 9 more reusable, et cetera, et cetera. And really, they're just at the – already they're, like, pushing the absolute limits of that vehicle. Yeah. Uh, it really – you know, it's it's the finest rocket by definition of, of length to width. Um, there's <laughs> – it's, like, two or three times more capable than it was at the launch. You know, they, this payload fairing is as big as it can be without – basically turning the thing into a giant, you know, sailboat on a pencil, you know, like <laughs> it's already at the max capacity for that, for that structure. And, um, you know, adding extra boosters to say a Falcon heavy, making a, a quad Falcon heavy, you're not doing yourself any favors. You're, you're still limited by volume constraints of the, of the payload fairing, the physical constraints through like the payload adapter, the, you know, the upper stage, the inner stage, the, the main core, all still have considerations of, of how much, you know, thrust and, and, and loads they can handle. So why keep stretching something when, when all of that best case scenario, you're still going to be, you know, throwing away, uh, a say, I don't know, $8 million upper stage. I'm totally making up a number, um, a not free upper stage. You're still limited very much by size and payload capacity. And, um, and the vehicle that's already susceptible to things like upper level winds, that uh, a bigger vehicle wouldn't be susceptible to. And it's still using, a I mean, there's so many reasons why it's like, no, let's, let's cut our ties now. Just like when they were doing Falcon one, they were going to make a bigger Falcon one. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they were thinking about doing a Falcon five and they made a really at the time, crazy decision to pursue a nine engined Falcon, you know, Falcon nine, they went from a single engine on Falcon one and they all of a sudden cut off all funding for Falcon one and they dove straight into Falcon nine. And, you know, a lot of the people at the time were like, why didn't they just keep going with Falcon 1? Yeah, so many people you know, were so, had, like, uh, you know, aghast about that because there hadn't been a American launch vehicle with multiple engines on it since the Saturn V. You know, nobody had ever thought about, you know, putting multiple engines together and running them that way since that huge moon rocket that we used in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it was... And it was, a, it, was a, it was a big risk. The Falcon 9 was a big risk compared to Falcon 1. And I think we're at that exact same turning point where it's like, why spend even a dime more on the Falcon program? Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, as great as they are, and as much as I think we all love it, this is like that uh, everything that you want for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, this is what Starship is trying to achieve and, and, and one-up, you know, and get into that next level that we've uh, as humans have never unlocked before and i think that's the the critical point here is this is this is not just a, another rocket this is like a whole new system a new way of getting things into space and hopefully a routine and inexpensive way to get things into space and that's uh that's very very exciting yeah and as i always like to tell people um there's a certain point where your enemy no longer becomes the money or the engineers you have working for it becomes nature itself physics basically says that you just can't pull anything more out of it and the falcon 9 is pretty much at the limit of what physics um can allow and jeremy <laughs> heindrich Heindreich in our YouTube chat room is asking, I wonder why they do not consider putting the Raptor engines inside of the Falcon 9. Well, that would have to be completely new tankage. You'd have to switch from Carolox, kerosene, RP-1, and liquid oxygen, and switch over to methylox, so methane and liquid oxygen working together. Um, you'd have to deal with new loads. So, uh, because a Raptor engine is going to give you a different amount of thrust than nine Merlins or a single Merlin on your upper stage are, you'll have to change out your GSE, your ground support equipment. Everybody forgets about just how important GSE is. I cannot tell you how incredibly important ground support equipment is. And people just completely blow over it all the time. Um, if you don't have ground support equipment, you don't have a functional rocket. You don't have a functional launch company in order to make that happen. So um, so once you start trying to tinker with things, you know, you, you definitely can to try to pull efficiency and more performance out of a vehicle. But if you're going to radically alter a vehicle, it may actually cost more to upgrade a Falcon 9 
to flying on Raptors than it would to just go for it with a super heavy slash starship with that there. So at a certain yeah. point, you have to have that uh, go with that. I was going to say there's the overlap. Like, yes, you could physically learn how to fly a Raptor on a vehicle that's already, again, at its absolute structural limits. Um, so you really wouldn't gain that much as opposed to just learning how to fly it on the vehicle that is intended to fly on. And also, let's not forget um, things like the upper stage, you know, a Merlin uh, vacuum engine is already something like, I want to say almost 10 times more powerful than an RL-10. Um, mm -hmm. It's super overpowered. A yes. single Merlin vacuum engine is so unbelievably overpowered that it's uh, it's insane. They have to like be able to, it's the, one of the deepest throttling engines because they have to be able to not crush their payloads at, at the end of the burn when the, when the vehicle is almost empty. You know, it's, it's pulling some serious Gs potentially. And uh, if you put something like a Raptor on there, you're starting at something that's already twice as powerful now. There's literally not root like there, it would smash the payload <laughs> with, <laughs> with a Raptor. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't even have, you know, the, the Merlin has pendulum injectors, so it can do deep throttling. Um, the Raptor does not. Sounds like the Raptor is probably going to be limited to something like 50 or 40 percent throttle capacity uh, for deep throttling. So you're already looking at two or three times more minimum thrust than even just a Merlin vacuum. So that's two or three times more G loads <laughs> on your vehicle and payload at the end of the. I mean, it just why not just make a vehicle that's supposed to be used with this engine in the first place? And that's exactly what they're doing. You yeah. Know? And in our YouTube chat room, uh, there was a comment from Bill Bre Brenner, uh, which basically said, uh, on the order of, uh, you know, Elon is bringing, Elon is a software person. So with these multiple iterations, he's basically bringing a, uh, there we go. Yeah. Musk's origins are in software development. He's bringing software dev methods to rocketry, which is frequent iteration, uh, which is something that mm. we just have n not seen really ever in the history of, of the United States aerospace uh, companies. So, I mean, constant research and development, that's like, who who does that? So, I mean, there's like companies that build airplanes that don't do that. Right. Well, I'm glad you said U.S. companies, because I think this is similar to how the Soviet Union was developing in the early days. You know, they would they would build hardware, test it, break it, repeat on a pace that, you know, scared us Americans because yeah. they were just iterating so quickly and, and making big hardware changes and testing, like they tested the N1, which the N1 is probably the closest thing to the Starship that's ever flown. You know, it had what, 31 engines or 32 yes. or something engines around it's on a its lot. first stage. <laughs> and they test it by flying it. Like, it doesn't get more testing by hardware than trying to fly a moon rocket with 32 engines on its first stage of thir whatever it is, 30, I don't remember. Yeah, they didn't take their five um, N1s with their fittings out to Marshall and burn them on the pad and see how, or on the test stand and see how it works. No, they just like hauled it, hauled it out to the <laughs> launch pad, stuck it up, and then went, all right, here we go. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> works. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> and of course, uh, we Which, know it's it is cool to see this this type of iteration. Should we do a little like history rundown? Because I feel like there's still um a yeah. good amount of confusion over um where they're at exactly. You know, we talked a minute ago about uh you know how we saw it differently at, at IAC twenty sixteen and how each year we see a different version. Should we talk about how they're actually building and developing this vehicle now? Or yeah, or you... yeah that sounds yeah, let's go for it. So because there's, yeah. there's lots so of... Today, yeah, go for it, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> so today, as we speak, um, the main primary test site for anything that's actually like related to Starship um, is Boca Chica. And Boca Chica is actually a village and a beach outside of Brownsville, Texas. It's the very, very southern tip of Texas. But don't get this confused with McGregor, Texas. That's where SpaceX develops engines and test engines. So previously, we've been seeing the Raptor firing up at McGregor, which is, I don't know, kind of in the middle of Texas. Um, that's where the Raptor has lived so far. You know, that's where um, it's built in Hawthorne, California, at their headquarters, ships out to McGregor, and then goes back and forth based on what uh, is necessary. And we saw it took until um, the third version of like a, you know, of a full flow version of the Raptor before they actually stuck that on a prototype vehicle, a prototype hopper. And that's what we're calling Star Hopper. Um, so 
Star Hopper is what we're seeing on screen right now, which is that um, lovely, basically a, a trash can with three legs <laughs> or a, a, literally a water tower. It is quite literally built by a water tower company. It's a heavy just set of tanks. Inside there is a methane tank, a liquid methane tank, and a tank for liquid oxygen. And then on top of it are some COPVs, so some composite overwrap pressure vessels that hold nitrogen and helium. Nitrogen for the control thrusters, helium to backfill and pressure as, as fuel drains out of it. And then it's basically just got some like rudimentary legs and now a Raptor engine stuck underneath it. That is the, this is the day one of Starship. This is not going to go much higher than, uh, um, the next hop they're aiming at is 200 meters. So, you know, 660 foot taller in altitude or whatever. And then I think this one's claiming it can go up to 5,000 meters, but I don't think it'll ever go that high because it doesn't really have aerodynamic surfaces uh, capable of controlling its landing and things like that. So um, so that that step one has been get the engine going. So they, they have been doing that and making changes. And the current engine that's on Starhopper that we're seeing on screen now is the sixth version, serial number six. And that is now on Starhopper. It completed a 20-meter hop. But the confusing thing is at the same time, in Boca Chica and in Florida, we're seeing two orbital prototypes and these are going to be um the full size upper stage versions of starship so these will include six or seven raptor engines on them uh aerodynamic control surfaces proper kind of landing legs and they're going to start testing those supposedly by the end of the year and that's where it gets kind of confusing because we have star hopper and then we have two orbital prototypes um appearing in two different parts of the country and and then it's and the, like this isn't even the booster yet. It's just it's really there's a lot of stuff going on. And unless you're like paying close attention to all this stuff, it can be very, very, very confusing. So, so, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. So and Tim, would it be <laughs> would it kind of be fair to say that Star Hopper right now is kind of like a, a um, Grasshopper was back in in its flight testing phase at that time, um, and then yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then those orbital prototypes are going to be a little more like Falcon 9, our dev, where we're basically we're, we understand the physics behind it now. So now we're going to start really pushing the limits and see how this can go. Yeah, and it's somewhere between the the orbital prototypes are a little bit more, you know, the, 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 so just to clarify too, there was, Star, there was Grasshopper and there was F9R, which were two vehicles that help SpaceX learn how to land propulsively using um, kind of a Falcon 9 architecture and a Merlin engine, which is what the, you know, that's what the Falcon 9 uses. So they had to practice on these vehicles that were um, shorter and, you know, didn't have an upper stage on them or anything. They were literally just basically a fuel tank with a rocket engine. And now we're seeing that again with Starhopper and Raptor. And it's just practicing how to do those propulsive landings, how to throttle up, you know, all those little inputs and, and all those things. There's so many things people are like, well, why does this even matter? It only went up 20 meters. It's like, I don't think you know how much has to go into just making that happen. Uh, yes, 20 meters isn't very much, but, you know, being able to control the throttle of a full flow stage combustion cycle and come down landing softly enough to not break those crazy legs, um, that's a big achievement. And um, the the orbital version will be probably even more ambitious on its first flights than say something like the Falcon than the F nine R, um, which I don't think the F nine R ever went more than um, a kilometer or two in altitude. Yeah, unfortunately, and, uh, it detonated. So <laughs> yes, yeah, but they practiced their hover slam maneuver, and that's because yeah. um, the Falcon nine, even at its minimum throttle setting, when it's coming in for landing, is so empty, has such it's so light that even one of its nine Merlin engines at minimum throttle can't even hover. So they have to bleed off speed and hit zero velocity at zero altitude, like perfectly. And that was a really hard thing. You know, that's pretty nuts. Like, you know, no other propulsive landing vehicle that I know of had to do that. Like say landing on the moon, they had a deep enough throttle capability. They could hover. And that's not to say that landing on the moon wasn't amazing and (laughs) a big feat, but um, having to propulsively land without even the ability to like, stop to like take a breather and then start to descend again. Like you have to just nail it. Um, it's pretty difficult. And that's what the grasshopper did. And now uh, we're seeing something similar to that with, uh, with star hopper and soon these orbital prototypes. Yeah. And I think uh, a lot of people just are, not again, aren't used to seeing stuff. Um, you know, we're used to seeing stuff going from the test stand 
onto a a actual orbital test vehicle and then doing a test flight out of that. We're not used to seeing stuff go from a test stand to an in-atmosphere test to an orbital test and then getting to go um, with that there. I mean, we're just, the incrementalization of steps isn't something that that, air, that uh, most of us in the United States are used to with aerospace. Usually, uh, usually we talk about all up tests, you know, on our yes. first, on our first shot with it, you know, not, not okay let's go this high okay we're gonna go a little higher okay now we'll go a little higher with that there um and with the orbital test vehicle you know that really reminds me um of nasa's x-33 project their venture star project which was Mm -hmm. to develop a single stage to orbit replacement for the uh, at least for the cargo aspect of shuttle or deploying satellites and other things like that and x-33 um uh was was a subscale model of Venture Star, and they were essentially going to fly that to extremely high altitudes at very high velocities, and then have it re-enter and land, and basically just prove that the system could actually work. Is that kind of what we're looking at with the orbital prototypes that they're developing right now, or are we looking at like an actual vehicle that will do sort of like single stage to orbit, and you know uh, maybe once around or twice around, and then come back? I think you're right. It's it's pretty uh, relatable to the X-33, which um, just for the record, yes, this vehicle is physically capable of SSTO, uh, single stage to orbit, uh, like the X-33 was actually, uh, based on the math. I don't think that's to say it has enough fuel to be able to do a landing burn and things like that. Remember, it's not going to land on like landing gear or using aerodynamic, you know, it can't glide and fly and land softly like a space shuttle. This vehicle does require um, a healthy amount of Delta V to be able to land. I'm totally making up a number, but it might be, you know, like um, a, a kilometer a second or something of Delta V to be able to to scrub off propulsively or something like that. Like a not insignificant amount of fuel needs to be left over to be able to do these landings and recover the vehicle. So even though Starship will likely, these orbital prototypes, I'm guessing, will likely experiment when the high altitudes, you know, come up, you know, maybe go up, uh, you know, 10 kilometers or something, come screaming back down and practice that weird belly flop thing that it's going to do and then go tail down. <laughs> That'll be its first steps. I think, I don't know if these first orbital prototypes will ever be mounted to a super heavy booster, but if they're to actually go full orbital and things like that, and with the expectation of coming back and surviving reentry, I'm guessing they will be stacked on top of a super heavy booster. I don't think we'll ever see them um, get to orbital velocities and have enough margin to be able to return. Although they wouldn't have a payload, so they could stuff it just to the gills with with fuel yeah. and not deliver a payload to orbit. So, I mean, who's to say at this point? <laughs> that might very well be what they end up doing. But, um, yeah, it'll be kind of step-by-step, step, like you're saying. It'll be high altitude, get up uh, out of most of the atmosphere, practice that, re-entry, that atmospheric reentry, and the, the aerodynamic control services that are new to this vehicle that no one's ever done anything like this. So, yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, uh, too, you got to mitigate the thermal load that you get when you're coming back, entering through the atmosphere of, as well. And there's really not been much talked about in that, that, that front. There's been, uh, things thrown out there, like, if, eva- like, essentially developing an evaporative system on there. There's also been a discussion of ceramic tiles, which would then basically make me think back to space shuttle, which would mean, okay, you're no longer going to have rapid reusable capability because you're going to have to check all of those tiles after every re-entry to make sure that everything's good with them. Um, so like, there's just a really a lot of unknowns that are going to be happening with this and those orbital prototypes, mm-hmm. um, hopefully are going to answer those. Well, let's, let's take a moment and, and kind of talk about the heat, the heat shield and, and the heating of a vehicle like this, because you're right with, if they don't reach orbital velocity, say you're going, um, uh, I'm just going to make up a number again. Say you go 20,000 kilometers an hour as opposed to 27,000 kilometers an hour. Well, let's do the math, make it easy. Say, because uh, the, 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 the deal with re-entry speeds and re-entry heating is if you double your speed, um, the heat goes up by the cube. So um, instead of as opposed to the square. So you actually are going up like 16 times if you double. Or is it 16 or 8? No, 8 times. Sorry, I always do this wrong because <laughs> it's 2 times 2 times 2. So eight times uh, the heat, even if you just double your velocity. So they can kind of go incremental with this reentry heating, make sure that whatever system they have in place, um, test it out step by step, make sure it's holding up well, and then keep pushing it potentially later on. Um, and we've seen different, different theories, but I think one of the big reasons they went with stainless steel is because it can handle higher heat loads, period. 
like period. <laughs> you know, yes, it was supposed hole. to be uh, uh, carbon composites originally. They were going to make the whole dang thing out of carbon, and then they switched over to stainless steel. Yeah, and I think it's mostly because, you know, yes, you could keep carbon composites cool enough to handle reentry, but that heat shield will be massive. It will be it'll be heavy on its own. It'll, it'll take up weight. Um, and even say, you know, they, they had talked about transpirational cooling, like you said, where it kind of sweats out methane out of its pores for some spots on Starship. You know, even even if it still needs ceramic tiles, the airframe itself can handle significantly higher heat loads than, say, the aluminum airframe of the space shuttle. Um, there was talk about building a titanium space shuttle for a little bit, which would have been a lot more expensive. And although heavier overall, would have been able to handle a lot higher heat loads and would have survived with a lot smaller heat shield and maybe a, a lot simpler heat shield. Um, the space shuttle, you know, had famously had over 20,000 individual tiles. And those tiles, almost every single one of them was completely different from one another. So just because the space shuttle was really complicated in that aspect with its, with its tile and its, and its, uh, heat shield reentry system, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's going to happen with Starship because overall the whole airframe can handle substantially higher heat. But, um, they could maybe be doing something like big, huge, uniform, ceramic heat tiles on surfaces, you know, like on, you know, like say you have a, a shape like this, all of this area could have the, a uniform shaped heat, sh heat shield. And then as it tapers, you'd have to have unique ones, or maybe that's where they could use different types of heat shielding or around, you know, joints or the, the fins and wings like that, you know, might have different styles of cooling. So it's not, we, we can't just say ceramics were kind of an interesting choice on the space shuttle and it ended up being really hard to refurbish and really hard to check and they're fragile and it was expensive and blah, blah, blah. We can't necessarily take that logic and apply it to a new vehicle because there's a lot of lessons that we're learning there and there's a lot of ways around that. And sorry, I'm, I'm going on a major rant here about heat shield, but who knows, maybe ceramic tiles will only be used on something like the fins and, and the very like chest plate of the, the vehicle where the heat loads are by far the highest. And then they can do transpiration cooling because the, the steel frame can stay, the steel airframe can handle a lot higher heat loads. And they're going, it's going to be fun watching that continue to evolve because we're already seeing it evolve a lot, you know, in that aspect. So. Yeah, yeah, and and, and, it, and it sounds like landing is going to be the, the really difficult uh, thing for it. Um, an Uber nerd on YouTube has a comment that I kind of want to sort of address a little bit, uh, which is that propulsive landing is the only way to go since Earth is the only planet with a thick atmosphere, you know, where we want to go, Venus does not count, um, to allow for aerodynamic flight. And I actually want to counter that, which is that when you arrive at Mars, when you're doing your entry into Mars's atmosphere, uh, you can actually generate lift and move your vehicle according to where it needs to go. Um, you know, they did this uh, with capsules that we returned to the Earth, you know, with uh, Gemini and Apollo. You can move your center of gravity off a certain area, have that center of pressure where you need it at, and you can actually do guided entry of your vehicle, mm -hmm. and you can do that on Mars. Um, and that's one of the advantages that they're looking at doing with the Mars 2020 rover is an actual hypersonic guided entry using the heat shield and some thrusters when, mm -hmm. when going in that way with it. Um, so I would think, I, think I would think something as big as Starship at Mars should be able to do that pretty easily as well up until the last you know couple hundred meters per second oh yeah you know, absolutely. that's absolutely i that's, mean but you know what if you're moving really fast you can basically make anything air, anything generate lift i mean just you could make yes. a brick generate lift in one percent atmosphere if you're moving it fast enough um and that's literally that's and that's kind of one of the ways that you can go about uh doing that but yeah and, but uh, just just to double down on on their point though that it, it, you can't do the final bit of touchdown. You can't, Absolutely, you can't use yeah. giant wings and make a soft touchdown. And there's no runways on Mars. There's no runways on the moon or anything like that. So you do have to do a precise propulsive landing on Mars. Um, but that brings up a, a point, actually. Um, we noticed, actually, that so, so NASA's handing out a lot of contracts for the Artemis program and some commercialization um, work with going back to the moon. And SpaceX won um, a study with, I think, Marshall or JPL or somebody to, or actually with Kennedy Space Center to, to study how propulsively landing a large vehicle like Starship, what that's going to do to the regolith. I mean, think about that. Like, think about how much, 
even a small lunar lander kicked up dust and and some of that dust stayed in orbit yes. it gets electronically you know, magnetically charged and it, it gets kicked around and, and stays in the in, around the moon for far too long basically little bullets flying around um what's going to happen when you land something with you know 200 tons of thrust on the, uh, yeah. with a single engine yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, back in 2013, there was a, a, a NASA spacecraft in orbit around the moon called LADY, um, and then China landed Chang'e 3 on the surface of the moon, and it actually kicked up enough dust that LADY was able to detect that dust when it was in orbit around the moon. So it's not even like oh. a 200-ton thrust vehicle that can do that. A little itty-bitty lander simply can do that as well. Kick up, kick up enough dust that you can actually detect it in that very thin exosphere of the moon. So, and you know, those are things you you have to think about. Like, are you going to have to end up shielding your lunar base um, from basically high speed regolith that'll be coming off of it there? So, you know, that's, that's, we might have to land like deep in craters or really interesting uh, topographical areas that are, you know, that will help make sure that the debris isn't just going straight out, you know, and like if you landed on top of a mountain on the moon and you kick <laughs> something out straight <laughs> sideways fast enough, that's going to whip around and come right back to you, you know? Uh, so landing in areas or maybe even having to send small rovers or something to build up trenches and build up a shield, like you were saying, yeah, just to make sure that it's the vehicle doesn't kick up dust and, and start putting orbiting bullets around the moon and make it impossible for other vehicles to land, that is a strong consideration. That's yeah. something that's going to have to be figured out and solved before we have routine, you know, if we're sending 100 vehicles there in a, a year, all kicking up <laughs> that much <laughs> orbital debris, that's not good. Yeah, I don't know if a crater would even be a good idea because you would then have the ability to allow some of that material going out to come right back in uh, at your vehicle <laughs> and potentially damage it. So that, that may not work out as well either. So, ah, problems. No. Um, you know, these are, these are the <laughs> things you got to think about when you're making uh, uh, <laughs> really big uh, vehicles to land like that. So, yeah. You know what it might be. So, um, if you are, if you have the pleasure of being a, a gentleman that uses a urinal, um, there's a new type of urinal cake that has like spikes on it that makes it so as urine. This is the dumbest explanation ever. As urine hits it, uh, it it gets kind of directed out in all directions. You know, the the splatter doesn't come back at you. <laughs> Why am I talking about this? Anyway, so we're gonna uh, dump a lot of urinal cakes on the moon and have uh, yeah. the starship land right on top of them. So. Exactly. And Perfect. that diffuses and, and breaks up uh, so it doesn't splash right back. And the, you might have to land on a bunch of spikes is what I'm saying. They might have to make like a spiky crater that uh, kind of like sound suppression or not sound suppression, but but diffusion too. you know, in a, in a sound studio, you'll see spikes on the wall and that mm-hmm. makes sure that you don't get things pointing straight back at its source, creating, you know, um, unwanted echoes. And that'd be the same thing with landing on the moon. They might have to land in a giant pit of spikes in order to not have that, that debris <laughs> shoot right back at its source. All right. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah, don't tell Neil that we're going to have to land it in the crater. He won't be happy about that. Um, so there's some, <laughs> there's some there's been a lot of questions to kind of talking about the safety of getting Starship um, up, you know, the, the apparent lack of abort system. Nobody's really talked about how a, a Starship is going to be able to abort. Um, there's also some folks talking about orbital refueling as well. Um, and those are some two like very big challenges. Um, and then also going to Mars, the human factor as well. Um, humans really don't do so good in radiation, um, regardless of whether it is solar or cosmic. Um, it really just doesn't end particularly well. It may not be something that happens instantaneously, but it is something that happens over time and it only compounds as well as it happens over time. Right. And those are, those are some really big problems that we're going to have to contend with. Um, and the, I mean, Starship is going to have to deal with that if it's going to be going on these long duration flights. Well, and, and the orbital refueling is another thing that they want to contract um, mm-hmm. with NASA for part of the you know Artemis program is looking at orbital refueling. We've never really done large orbital transfers. Yes, like the ISS actually gets 
um, I think, is it Fuel from Progress? Is that yes. what it is? Yeah. I was going to say um, there was a shuttle mission in the 80s, uh, STS-41G, where they actually did uh, basic orbital refueling of a satellite. And then there was also uh, the uh, remote manipulator fueling experiment that they did on the space station as well, um, I think about five years ago, where they actually moved the, uh, the arm into a place and then had it actually work with different systems that are on satellites right now to see what it would take to refuel them and transfer fluid through them but that's I, cool i think and the difference with spacex take, I mean, the difference with spacex yeah, here is that it is cryogenic so it's not yeah. just fuel as is you know it's not hydrazine or, or nitrogen tetroxide that we're throwing in there like we got cold stuff and we got to keep that cold <laughs> stuff liquid as we're transferring it yeah and it's uh, i mean it's just a lot of it and i know yes. that doesn't necessarily mean it's uh much you know 10 times harder because there's 10 times more fuel, but it's, it's just a lot of potential energy. You know, when you have that big of a pressure vessel exchanging, uh, fuel through one pressure vessel to another pressure vessel, you're just, you know, you're, you're putting in a lot of potential energy and, um, it's just kind of, it's just, it's just a scary thing that needs to go really well every time. Mm-hmm. And, um, Starship in order to make it, uh, to the moon even requires orbital refueling, uh, if it's going to Mars, it has to be totally topped off 100% to get to Mars, do the trans-Martian burn and do the, uh, the landing burn. It needs to be fully topped off in Earth orbit. So that's, we're looking at, you know, multiple refuelings of other starships or tanker versions or whatever. So it's a problem that has to be solved. That's, that can be. I'm not saying that it's not going to be able to be solved, but look at how, Difficult it is even for something like, and I don't mean to bring this up, but, uh, you know, but Dragon, the Dragon Anomaly recently, the firing something like an abort system when you're dealing with high pressure propellants, um, and even in known things like titanium can cause unintended consequences. And now we're dealing with cryogenics in huge containers, uh, that will probably at some point have people, you know, on them having to transfer fuel in orbit is just a, it's a big, thing to figure out yeah you know? <laughs> and you know even long term too if you're doing a long-term flight like out to mars you've got to keep those cryogenics you know cryogenics all the way to mars and that's that's not a quick trip uh for that either mm-hmm. e- any way that you go about it even if you do the maximum speed that is that is uh hypothesized you know a three month trip to mars something like that or even a month to mars at, at very high velocities at just the right time even that i'm um, keeping something cryogenically cooled in a tank in a specific area over the entirety of a month is not an easy task with the amount of the amount of cryogenic liquid that's going to be used in it Mm-hmm. Well, you, we had talked before the show for just a second about, you know, they're planning to do autogenous pressurization, mm-hmm. which they, that actually, I think the space shuttle actually did that in its main orange fuel tank. It used tap offs from the RS 25s to feed, you know, uh, gaseous versions of uh, liquid oxygen and hydrogen back into the tanks. I don't think it had, um, hydro helium to backfill. Someone is probably going to be correcting me with that as we speak. So uh, autogenous pressurization isn't unheard of and, and isn't unheard of at least while in flight where you have boil off and you have um, liquid fuel being turned into hot gas and, and can be pumped back in the tanks. But to do that, you know, while you're just coasting on a, like you said, a three, you know, at best one month, but most likely three to six months still in good scenarios, that's a long time to perfect some kind of cooling system and autogenous pressurization and all that stuff. It's, there's a lot to chew off there. Yeah. And, um, and I also think that there's a lot too to be said about developing a life support system that can sustain a hundred people on board. Um, right now we have a life support system that can sustain six, maybe seven, eight, nine, um, even up to like 15 to 20 people for a very short period of time when shuttle would visit the International Space Station. Um, but we're talking like a hundred people is a lot of people. I don't know if you've ever seen like a hundred people together. That's a lot of people. Um, and that's a lot of oxygen. That's a lot of carbon dioxide. That's a lot of water that needs to be used. Um, and these are things that I, I, and I'm going to qualify this. Things that are not being talked about, but I also feel like these are things that are being worked on right now. It's just that it's not really being talked about publicly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, 
we have to look at something like Dragon Capsule, which is obviously intended to take humans um, doing a fairly routine. I'm not going to ever say space flight's routine yet, but, you know, low Earth orbit is has been done now for over 50, almost 60 years. So it's, you know, we're looking at a new system like Dragon putting people up into space and even watching how difficult it is to develop Dragon and, and Starliner by Boeing, seeing how long it's taken them. They were supposed to be flying in 2016. Uh you know, watching how hard it is just to do something on that scale uh, with NASA funding, it should help you understand that the idea of actually getting to Mars by 2024 with an entirely new system that has so many new technologies, that has such a large scale, uh, this we're kind of getting to that point now of can SpaceX take Starship to Mars by 2024? I personally don't think that'll happen by 2024. Yeah, and I was going to say... Mostly because life support and, and human considerations. Yeah, and I was going to say GLTC Princess in our chat room was asking, do you, know, do you think Starship is actually going to get uh, you know, people to Mars by 2024? I'm also f very firmly in the no category um, for that, because, simply because there's a, still a, not just you know human aspect of it with everything with that. There's also a lot of technical stuff that still needs to be solved as well, like running mm -hmm. a large number of engines together at the same time, um, figuring first of all figuring out how many engines you want and then also with with uh, starship as well you have to figure out well how many of, of how many vacuum engines do i want how many sea level engines do i want do i want them to all just be vacuum engines as well um because you know mars one percent atmosphere maybe there's no point in developing a nozzle for one percent atmosphere maybe you should just keep it as a vacuum engine because you're i mean you're right. just you're just closer to it than you are at sea level here at earth so go away with the with the entirety of the sea level nozzles on them um and i feel like really the big the big factor that ev everybody is having problems with is radiation so there's just no way to get around that regardless of of i mean you can fly to mars as fast as you like but if you get one solar flare from the sun you know a nice coronal mass ejection fired right at you I hope you enjoy it. So, um, <laughs> cause there's very little you can do at that point, um, in order to make that happen. So, so I feel like 2024. Oh, yeah. I was going to say the, the radiation thing. We also have really, really, really strict standards for how much radiation a human, like really strict. I mean, yeah. it sounds like, uh, a full trip to Mars, even with like a mild, a normally shielded spacecraft. Um, cause obviously once you get outside of Earth's mag mag magnetosphere and, you know, beyond the Van Allen radiation belts, look out. Um, you know, you're, yes, you're exposed to additional, a lot more radiation than we are here at Earth, but it's still survivable. And it's not much different than smoking cigarettes, like a pack a day, as yeah. far as um, how much potential for cancer there is, you know, and, and I, I think there'd be a, still a line out the door of astronauts that are like, I don't care about that risk. Send me to Mars. Like, I, I absolutely would be one of those people. Um, if I knew that, that there was, uh, and I understand that there's that kind of a risk, and I would most certainly be willing to take that kind of a risk. Um, but at the same time, uh, that's the, the, uh, you know, pack of cigarettes a day, uh, in terms of radiation, in terms of cancer risk is essentially for background radiation that doesn't include, um, things like, like, you know, large solar storms being popped off in the direction of your spacecraft um, or or exceptionally strong cosmic radiation hits um, from events that happen uh, at that time, you know, because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, we got to remember, you know, it's not just our local neighborhood where things happen at, you know, you get things like gamma ray bursts and other stuff. And if you get one named just right, um, you can and, and and it's happened before with satellites in orbit, um, you know, outside of the Earth's magnetosphere where they've gotten blast by these gamma ray bursts. Um, and, I, and I'm just thinking that there was a Soviet mission, um, I think in the 80s, where it and another uh, spacecraft from the United States got, essentially got irradiated by this massive uh, gamma ray mm -hmm. burst uh, during that time period. And that I don't know if that was the first detection of a gamma ray burst, but it's definitely one of the first prominent ones that they had because they had multiple data from two different places. So they were able to kind of figure out where it was at. Oh, uh, but you can imagine hitting a strong. spacecraft with that with people on board. That's not really 
a good thing. Um, and it turns out superpower is not a thing. Um, so yeah, so it doesn't, doesn't end, uh, particularly well with that. So, uh, to kind of go to YouTube with JC there, uh, asking, uh, will the Starship be the main ship of SpaceX in the future? Just like replacing the Raptor engine or with like a fusion engine or maybe warp drives or something. I mean, that's looking definitely very long term, um, down the road. I have to applaud JC for doing that. Um, but, uh, is now that we're getting into this era of moving a lot of the R and D, if not most of the R and D, um, to super heavy and starship, is that now what we're going to be doing? And is that what we're going to be flying these payloads on? I, you know, I think the key thing is learning how to be able to send a vehicle out, make it perform work and have it come back and be ready to do that again almost immediately. And that's going to be an evolving process that's going to be streamlined, just like the Falcon 9 landing. The very first one that landed never flew again. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it took a while for them to get to the point where they're flying the same booster at most so far three times. I think we're about to see the fourth flight of a block five here soon. Um so, and now they're finally like folding up the legs on a Block 5 Falcon 9. They're doing things that ha help enable it to fly quicker. And it's an evolution. And I think Starship is just a new bed, a new platform to be able to put a bunch of new technologies and continually evolve it that has a lot more potential than the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy ever did because of its physical size, because of new attributes like stainless steel, and finally solving how to re-enter land and hopefully just be topped off and refueled and inspected quick and fly again uh, is, is, a, is a new platform. And say someday they get approved to be able to put on like NERVA, you know, nuclear propulsive rocket engines, which would enable really fast transits to Mars uh, and really a crazy amount of Delta V. Maybe they can still stick something like that, new technologies onto these platforms, you know, onto a starship, just like how Falcon 9 kept getting stretched and added grid fins. All of a sudden, one day, grid fins popped up on it and cold nitrogen gas thrusters and, you know, new technologies were, were put on an existing vehicle. I think that's going to be exactly what we're seeing starship. They're just taking it up physically in size and up physically in um, with a, a new engine that's a perfect candidate for reuse for multiple engines, you know, 30 plus engines on the perimeter of the vehicle and refueling it on Mars. So it's solving those things that couldn't be solved with, with, uh, with the Falcon 9 and Falcon heavy. And this is a, a new platform that can s continue to evolve and make better and better and continue tweaking as SpaceX does. And Nick on YouTube is asking uh, a pretty good question that I really like here. With the BFR being almost as large as the space station, which the interior volume of, uh, of Starship is essentially the size of the International Space Station, uh, do you think we will start seeing more space stations around the Earth and even the Moon? And, you know, just with the payloads that Starship's going to be able to to have go up there. I remember seeing somebody did like a really cool artistic rendering of like a massive space telescope that, that uh, Starship could deliver. And I kind of, my heart started going a little fast because I was like, yes, please. Um, when I saw that. So, um, you know, this, this is this, you know, Starship, if it works, has the potential to change the game in terms of payloads that we actually do send into space. Well, I, you're exa I mean, we're looking at if the cost can come down and the volume goes up dramatically, it will bring out a whole new enterprise, a whole new class and a whole new economy to boom. Because right now we're very constrained by the price. You know, uh, when we get down to a thousand dollars per kilogram to lower orbit, that's that's a substantial <laughs> number. And hotels don't weigh a ton. Hotels weigh hundreds of tons. You know, <laughs> if you want to put a hotel up. You can't have it cost trillions of dollars. So by bringing the economy down by an order of magnitude or more, uh, it will open up the opportunity to have new payloads that are large and, and commercially viable. And like you said, um, you know, having a nine meter wide payload fairing as opposed to, uh, you know, four or five meter wide payload fairing physically opens up, um, what were previously just big volume constraints. A lot of satellites aren't necessarily mass constraint. They're, they're physically constrained by their size. So um, that's why James Webb Telescope opens up and unfurls to its final diameter because um, it still has to fit within a five-meter fairing. It's, it's flying yes. on the largest flying fairing today on the Ariane 5. Mm -hmm. And imagine what we could do if it didn't have to unfold, if it could just fly as is open, ready to go on something like Starship. I mean, it's just game changing. It's, it brings the cost down immensely and the complexity and the, and the risk and 
everything comes down a lot when you when you physically have that capability. Yeah, and I also think about, uh, you know, if a Falcon 9 can launch 60 Starlink satellites at a time, um, you know, a, a Starship sure could put a lot of Starlink satellites in orbit at a time. Um, and that's also what SpaceX is really hedging their funding bets on for Starship as well, is that Starlink is going to actually work and make that happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Starlink is vital to the company's future. That is, if that gets up and operational, that's they just printed themselves money. Because not only are they undercutting, you know, uh, say any other company wants to build a constellation like this of thousands of satellites, they have to hire a satellite company to manufacture these. They have to pay for rides on uh, another, you know, on another vehicle. SpaceX is developing in-house their own satellites. They're developing in-house their own ground link systems are developing and they have their own ride to space. They're going to be un able to undercut and outperform anyone else attempting this feat. And a lot of people are attempting this feat right now. This is a very desirable thing. It's a, a global constellation of internet. Uh, and SpaceX will be able to physically undercut them all just based on the way they're, they're doing this. And uh, once that's operational and they're selling uh, internet from space, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, they just printed themselves a lot of money, and that will very much secure uh, Starship's future and beyond. Yeah, so those uh, those Falcon 9 flights with the Starlink, hopefully they're going to get starting to get a little quicker with those uh, because since that's going to be basically the big moneymaker uh, for them and the primary source of funding for their their Martian ambitions um, with that. Yeah. There. So uh, we'll see if, like, they're already... I'm hearing two more are on the, the books for this year is what people are starting to say now. Mm -hmm. So we're already going to go from 60 satellites. I think 50 of them are, are doing well. Maybe, maybe they made some tweaks to make sure all 60 that go up at a time, uh, do well. But, uh, yeah, we're going to start seeing triple the number of satellites by SpaceX in a matter of one year. And then next year, there might be, who knows, five, six, seven, eight, nine more launches and boom, the constellation's up and running already. I mean, that's. That's absolutely incredible. That's yeah. insane. So what are we, Tim, what are we looking at for Starship for the, or Star Hopper and, and also Starship as well, and even Super Heavy for the rest of the year? What is, what are some of the things that we should really be looking out for, uh, from now until the end of the year? Yeah. We're only, um, about a week or two from seeing Star Hopper hop again already. They're preparing it for its 200 meter hop. So that's going to be the first milestone that we see. And around that time, it might, most likely will be after the 200 meter hop, we'll, we'll see Elon do an updated presentation on their ambitions and on their plans. And that'll probably make everything that I'm about to say from here on out completely false. But <laughs> <laughs> the next thing that I'm expecting to see is to see those prototype, uh, the, the orbital prototype vehicles that are being built not only at in Florida, but also at Boca Chica. I, I expect we'll, we'll start to see the aerodynamic services get um, put on those. We'll start to see, uh, we're already seeing bulkheads, so like the, the shapes of the tanks be put in and welded in place. And we're starting to see things like thrust structures where they're going to mount the Raptor engines um, arrive on site and things like that. So we're starting to see things that are more than just a giant cylinder and more than a tapered fairing. We're starting to see hardware that will be capable of, of allowing them to do these um, suborbital-ish hops. So I think once we start seeing aerodynamic services, once we start seeing more Raptors arrive um, at these sites, That'll be the next step. Landing legs, whatever they're going to do for landing legs now on, on Starship, um, whether or not those are still connected to fins and uh, like they had been as we know it now, or whether or not they will do something more traditional, Falcon 9 style maybe with legs that deploy from the fuselage or whatever happens next, we'll start to see that hardware arriving really soon, I think. You know, if they're on pace and based on the pace we're seeing them, We'll probably start seeing stuff like that arrive in the next couple months, in the next month or two, like start seeing fins, start seeing legs, um, control thrusters, things like that. Um, that's next, I think. And then I don't know about the booster. The booster is, in my opinion, almost something that's already solved. It's basically scaling up a Falcon 9. Um, so the biggest thing for them is learning how to do the atmospheric reentry with the upper stage, with the Starship portion. And then once that's solved and, and they feel confident about the system that's in place, Make a huge, giant, long tube with 30-plus Raptor engines on the bottom of it and let her rip. That's In in SpaceX terms, that's pretty easy, I think, these days compared to um, the actual Starship. And do you think that they're going to end up uh, lifting payloads or uh, people first? What do you think? Oh, they'll, they'll do multiple test runs before anyone gets on it. I, I think it'll be a while before people are still um, on it, but... 
I wouldn't be surprised if they're starting. They got to start considering that. You know, they promised you Zaka Meizawa, who is um, a big contributor financially to this program, so he can do the Dear Moon stuff. You know, they they promised him a flight around the moon in 2023. Yeah, and if that's anywhere near feasible, um, they got to start thinking about how to get humans on a thing that's yeah. not even done being developed. And so, uh, IAC um, 2017, we were told that uh, Starship's going to be used for point to point travel as well, potentially. Yeah, and that makes sense to me. Um, we did learn that they're probably going to forego the booster because, again, if you're not actually putting a payload into orbit, if you're not trying to deliver 20, 30, 40, 50 tons into orbit and you're doing suborbital hops, you can do single stage. You know, it, it does actually remove a lot of complexity of having to restack, you know, all that stuff and, and uh, refuel two vehicles when it sounds like for most trips, you know, you can pretty easily have performance margins without the booster. And that'll be cool. And I, I see that being totally valid. Again, once the system's solved, once they have a system that's rapidly reusable, um, they can do whatever physics deems possible. And when you have this much legroom and this high performance of an engine and a vehicle that can handle high heat loads and all of this stuff, you're talking about a vehicle that, that can do anything that physics says is possible, really. So with, uh, with all the development that's happening and everything with it, when do you think the first orbital flight of a starship is going to happen? Oh, God. I'm putting you on the spot here, Tim, and we're going to hold you to this. I would say if we – I don't think we will see a starship in orbit. Remember, in orbit, not space. We're talking orbital velocity, mm -hmm. reenter from orbital velocity. I don't think we'll quite see that in 2020. Um, I know a lot of people think that, and that is the current plan. I don't think that, that would happen until 2021. That will require the booster. That will require a lot of work done at Pad 39A, which we haven't even talked about that. But you know, they had a big environmental report that mm -hmm. shows a lot of their plans for 39A and how it's going to support Starship. Um, and there's a lot that they're going to have to do. Oh, there's a lot that's going to be done there, and I just don't think that's possible. Um, in to have all that done and ready to fly a vehicle in 2020. Look at how long it took to get 39A just ready for um, the first launch that they did with CRS 10 or 11, I think was the first one they did from 39A. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it took years that they leased that pad, I think in 2014, mm -hmm. and that pad went operational in 2017 or 18. Mm -hmm. And by, uh, I think it was 2018. Maybe. I don't remember. But by the time it went operational, uh, you know, it had been three or four years. And now we're looking at more. We don't even have a flame trench. There's not even a tower. There's no ground support. I just don't think any of that stuff will be totally done and ready to support an orbital vehicle um, in by the end of 2020. So I'm saying 2021 would be the earliest All right, that we I'm, see an orbital. I'm going to go out there and say uh, I'll get a little more precise with mine. But I say I think we will not see an orbital flight of a starship until fourth quarter 2022. So I'm a little more pessimistic about their ability to do that. Uh, but I feel like this would be um, a good uh, maybe moon pie RC cola bet in order to work with. So loser <laughs> loser buys the other one, uh, an RC cola and a moon pie. Well, let me, let me say that I'll double down then and like solidify mine to saying in the year 2021. <laughs> so that 2022. Right. And I'm saying uh, that I could maybe see it happening like by the by Q4 of 2021. So I'll, I'll, I'll go a year up on you. But that's still insanely ambitious, even by my uh, ultra loving and ultra optimistic fanboy attitude. Uh, 2021 <laughs> is is uh, I'll admit it's pretty obscene. So, yeah. Oh, man. Well, at least nobody's going to have to eat a rocket engine with mustard out of this. So that's pretty good. So, all right. So, uh, that, that is, uh, I, that has just been a fantastic review today of Starship and all the stuff that we have to look forward to, uh, with that coming up. So, Tim, thank you so much for coming on today and also taking, uh, taking your time out to talk with us, uh, throwing some of your media our way as well. And it's just been, uh, fantastic to talk about this, uh, with everybody here today. And of course, we wouldn't be able to have these talks either without your support. Uh, you folks, our patrons of tomorrow are the ones who help make this happen. 
and we have uh, the ability to fund us, if you'd like to, uh, financially over at patreon.com slash TMRO. Or if you'd like to now, you can go to youtube.com slash TMRO slash join, and that allows you to do that too. And we really like that one because on that, you can literally give us as little as a dollar per month. That's all it takes. We used to have that on Patreon. We love that you had the capability of doing that. And now we have that back um, with it on YouTube at youtube.com slash join. And of course, as uh, Everyday Astronaut was saying somewhere but down here, make sure to hit that like button. Make sure to subscribe. Hit the notification. Send it everywhere that you can. Uh, let everybody know about space because we're here to get people excited about space. And we can't do that without your help. And if you can't help us financially but you still like to help contribute to the show, you can head on over to community.tmro.tv and you can post there, put some topics on, and let us know how you would like to help the shows of tomorrow. So, that is it for Orbit 12.24. Thanks for tuning in today, and until the next show, keep exploring.